Hello! Welcome to the History and Computing Workshop on Screencasting and Teaching. My name is Carolyn Pedrucci and I'm a Professor of History um, at York University. So I'm currently doing a blended online course, Ancient North America, with the goal of eventually transmitting to a fully online course. So right now I'm actually putting all my lectures online and then meeting students in person uh, for tutorials. Uh, today I want to talk about the process of creating online lectures. The biggest benefit to creating online lectures, and an unexpected one, is that it's made me think much more deeply about my own pedagogy and the philosophies behind my uh, preparation of lectures. So one of the very first issues I encountered uh, was deciding whether the architectural foundation of my lectures was going to be audio or visual. So what would drive the narratives of my lecture? And then what would become the skeleton of the screencast? Uh, the second big question that I started to deal with was the level of detail in my lectures. How much did I want to share with students, both in an audio and video format or visual format? So with in-person lectures or analog lectures, I always err on the side of not overwhelming students with detail and focusing instead on a single argument per lecture. But with screencasting, you can certainly easily emphasize one big um, argument within a lecture, but I start, started to feel really exposed without having a lot of backup material um, to support my one big point. And I also became haunted by dead air in a video lecture. The third um, question that um, I've had to think about with doing screencasting is my position in a lecture. Am I central to the lecture or am I simply the background narrator or producer or director or all three? Um, I immediately discovered that I didn't want to be the sage on the stage, but rather I wanted to be the guide on the side. So I'm going to return to these three big questions at the end of my presentation, but I want you to keep them in mind while you're watching. So let's turn our attention to looking at different methods for creating online lectures. So the first method, which is by far the most common method, and you find this all over um, iTunes University, uh, and that is someone comes into your classroom while you're actually delivering lectures in a, in a physical class and records you and then you show these lectures online. So the benefit is that you don't have to alter your normal method of lecturing, but the disadvantage is that these screenings rarely translate really well into online lectures, in my opinion. So lecturers are often filmed speaking to people in an audience, and I think it's far better to speak directly to the camera so that you're addressing your digital audience rather than having your viewers watch you address another audience. So while lecturing in person, you often spend um, a fair amount of time developing a rapport with the, uh, with the, the uh, analog audience, and this rarely translates well to video. Uh, filming any audiovisual material secondhand, like your PowerPoint presentations, usually come out looking to be very poor quality. And then finally, you can't control the lighting and sound as easily as you can when you're creating a specific online lecture and taping yourself. So let's pause for a moment to take a look at an example of one of these um, online lectures, which is actually someone just uh, recorded giving a lecture in person. It's really exciting for me to, to be here. Uh, and there are studies um, that, that show this again and again. Um, okay, a second method of creating an online lecture would be uh, simply to um, record yourself delivering an oral lecture and then show your normal PowerPoint beside this lecture. And you can actually record yourself um, speaking to your PowerPoint and flipping through your PowerPoint while you're giving your lecture. So you can record both your talking head and also your screen. So I've spent a great deal of time thinking about this method and wondering how it would work. The benefit is that, again, you don't have to diverge that much from your usual method of lecturing. But the drawback is that you're not tailoring the presentation uh, specifically for your video audience. So I want to show you an example, a pretty good one, of someone who is doing this. Hi, my name is Jamin Patel, and I am manager of the solution sales technologist at Centillion. 
one of the things that we are going to do today is to look at bridges and how they are part of various solutions that we offer today. Let's start with what are bridges. Bridges are software adapters that allows to integrate an application for single sign-on. All right, the third method for creating an online video is where you record yourself giving a lecture directly to your camera, and then you add the visuals afterward embedded in the video editor. And this is the method that I've been using. Uh, the drawback to this method it is by far um, the most time consuming of the three methods. But the benefit is that I think you get a much better product geared specifically to your video audience. You can bolster and refine your interpretations and fix your mistakes right in the video editor. So and the video you're watching is actually currently an example of this. So a related issue to all three of these methods is who does the video editing? Video editing is a skill that takes time to learn, and it adds another layer of, of work to the process of preparing a lecture. So many people have been leaving this in the hands of a tech department, but I chose not to because I think there's a great deal of intellectual content and interpretation that goes into video editing, and I wanted to be the one in control of it for producing my own video lectures. So to both record my lectures and to do the, um, uh, the video editing, I use one program and it's called ScreenFlow. And uh, here's, a, here's an image of what ScreenFlow looks like um, on their website. I've simply been using the camera that comes in my iMac computer. Um, after the first couple of lectures, um, uh, initially I was using the microphone that came in my iMac camera, but then I decided to switch uh, because the sound quality wasn't that great. So I invested in a Blue Yeti microphone. And good audio, I think, is incredibly important in video lectures. And here's an example of why good audio is important. And listen to the hum in the background. Hello. I just wanted to go over your individual disease presentation and your narrated PowerPoint presentation that you're going to have to do. And what you're going to do is you're going to audio link either a Camtasia, a PowerPoint, you can use whatever program you like. So all in all, I got to say, I've really been enjoying video editing and I really love the program ScreenFlow. So it's very easy to embed YouTube videos. And here's an example of this. Panthalosa. Hey, I want to show you a short YouTube clip of um, uh, what uh, Pangea looked like, how it was formed, and then how it broke apart. It's also incredibly easy to embed home movies. And here's an example of something I've done in a class. So I actually vis visited Chaco Canyon in April of 2013 and I videotaped uh, my visit. So um, I'm gonna be showing you some of my footage. Let's pause for a moment actually to look at some footage of the canyon itself. Actually starting our driving tour of Chaco Canyon. Ready. Yeah, they said to uh, watch for elk too. There's a lot of elk. Okay, shut up. Wow. You can interactively guide someone through a website. And here's a short video on finding book, uh, uh, electronic journal resources uh, that I've made for students in my class. How to find an article online in York's University's um, electronic collections at the library. First thing to do is navigate to York's main page. You uh, click on current students, click on libraries, into the main search engine, enter the journal title. Once that's entered, then you click on Find. We see the journal coming up in the library catalog. We click on Click to access this resource. 
And then finally, um, I also use um, something called call-ups uh, frequently when I'm doing my lectures. And that's where I'm discussing something specific and I'm showing the students an image and I can highlight that portion of the image. So it's really good, for example, when you're using maps. So um, unfortunately, I could not bring in ScreenFlow to show you here today uh, because my uh, current old three-year-old Mac Air is not powerful enough to shoot, use ScreenFlow, but a brand new Mac Air would be powerful enough. But I would like to show you um, a six minute online quick start video. Turn your computer into an all-in-one creative studio with ScreenFlow. You can record your screen, create and edit video, import media, and upload directly to the internet. Let's see how easy it is to get started with ScreenFlow. Follow along as we complete a recording, do a few quick edits, then export and publish directly to YouTube. When first launched, ScreenFlow's configure recording window will automatically appear. You can also access this window from the ScreenFlow helper icon in the top right hand corner of the menu bar. ScreenFlow can simultaneously capture content from up to five sources. You can record your desktop video from your screen or from an external monitor, and video from a connected camera, audio from an available microphone and your computer speakers, and now with ScreenFlow 5, audio and video from a connected iOS 8 device. Once you have configured your recording, hit the red button to start. When you are done recording, go to the helper icon and select Stop Record, or use the keyboard shortcut Command Shift 2. The ScreenFlow editing window will then open automatically with your new video and audio recordings on the timeline. Once you have finished a recording, or brought in additional media through the media library, now it is time to tap into ScreenFlow's powerful editor. Let's go over the main areas of the ScreenFlow editing window. The large central area is the canvas. This shows you a preview of all the visual elements of your project. The wide area at the bottom is the timeline. This is a visual representation of the temporal length of your project. The timeline is divided into layers to manage clips overlapping at the same time. While there is no correct way to set up your layers, it is important to keep in mind that each layer will overlay the layers below it, which will come in handy when you want to add additional media to your project. On the upper right side of the editing window are the Properties tabs. These are the main editing controls of ScreenFlow, allowing you to configure each clip of your project. There is also a media library that stores all recorded and imported media in an unaltered state. Let's go through a couple of simple edits. At the end of this clip, my mouse cursor goes to the ScreenFlow helper icon to stop the recording. We don't need our viewers to see the behind the scenes action, so let's remove that. Zoom in using the Timeline Magnification slider in the bottom left corner to get a more precise view of your recording. Place the scrubber where you want to make a cut. Open the Edit tab in the ScreenFlow menu and choose Split, or press the T key. Now we can select the end of the clip we want to delete and hit Delete on our keyboard. Now let's add a logo for the end of our video and make it fade in and slowly move across the screen. Select your image file and drag it into the ScreenFlow timeline. Notice that it automatically appears in your media library as well. Let's fade in the logo by adding a transition from the previous clip. Click and drag the logo clip so it overlaps the previous clip. You will see the transition area appear where the two clips overlap. To edit the type of transition, double click the transition area. This will bring up the transition inspector where you can choose from different types of transitions. With ScreenFlow 5, you will notice we've greatly expanded the transition options. For this though, we'll choose the cross-dissolve transition. Let's see how it looks. The next step is to add a video action to the logo to shrink it in size and have it move to the bottom corner of our screen. First, select the logo clip on the timeline. Go to the Video Properties tab and select Add Video Action. A yellow video action box will appear on the selected clip. To create the movement, Place the scrubber at the beginning of the video action box. This is how the image will be seen before the action starts. Now place the scrubber at the end of the video action box. This is how the image will be seen after the video action occurs. Adjust the logo to the size and placement you want, and ScreenFlow will automatically animate the movement for you. 
To resize the logo, hold the Shift key to maintain aspect ratio and drag the corner of the logo, or adjust the scale in the Video Properties tab. Now move it to the lower right corner. Let's take a look at the video action we have just created. This is just a sample of the many powerful editing features of ScreenFlow. Once we have finished recording and editing our video, it's time to export. Under File Export, you'll find many options for customizing your final project. The Web High preset is a good starting point for getting your video ready for export. This will work for most videos that will be seen on the web, but it's possible to customize the presets by clicking the Customize button. In this case, I'm going to set the resolution to 1920 by 1080 and boost the data rate to 8000. For more information on export settings, check out our ScreenFlow knowledge base. You can also publish directly to popular video hosting sites within ScreenFlow. Under File Publish To, select your preferred destination. I'm using YouTube. Enter your credentials and send it to YouTube. And that's how easy it is to get started with ScreenFlow. ScreenFlow. Make epic content. Okay, so let's move on to the big challenges. I quickly encountered two huge problems with screencasting. Time and space. First, let's start talking about the challenge of space. Creating videos requires a huge amount of digital space. I bought a giant external hard drive solely for creating my online videos, uh, but I found that the program I was using was caching things on my um, desktop computer and it very quickly fill up, filled up the hard drive and it simply suddenly just froze in the middle of a recording once. So it took a bit of time to figure out what was going on and then to repair this problem. Uh, then I had the problem of figuring out how to back up my screencasting data. So I'm incredibly lucky to be married to a geek and he crafted both a way to back up things locally and off-site and to do uh, nightly off-site backups. And these backups actually do take all night just because there's so much data uh, generated when you're making uh, video lectures. So and it's a really good thing that uh, my geek loves me so much uh, because my big expensive hard drive literally crashed this past Saturday night. And had we not gone to the trouble of backing things up, I would have lost everything. So uh, yesterday I purchased an even bigger and more expensive external hard drive. Uh, and hopefully this one uh, won't crash as easily as the other one did. So this one's supposed to be more stable, but it does cost a lot more money. So another issue that you probably would encounter in creating ScreenFlow is your online connectivity. So um, I do everything at home. That's where all my equipment is. That's where it's easiest for me to produce the, these videos. But the problem is then that I need to have really high speed internet. Uh, you would not have this problem if you created your videos um, at uh, your university at York uh, because their internet speeds are incredibly quick. But at home, we have pretty good internet and pretty good upload speeds, but my videos uh, still take um, at least an hour to upload. So a 15 minute, minute video would take at least an hour to upload. My videos last anywhere from 15 minutes to up to 40 minutes. And uh, when they are uploading, I don't touch anything on the computer. I don't breathe. I don't, I don't do anything. I, I slowly back away and I let the machine do what it needs to do. So last week, our upload speed at home crapped out and I couldn't get my videos online. And I actually had to sneak over to Sheridan College, uh, which is just across the road and upload my videos from there. So um, now for the problem of time. So there's many added layers in the creation of online videos. You, use, you have the usual time it takes to prepare your lecture. Then you have the usual time it takes to find your images. Um, but one of the problems is that when you're um, doing screencasting and you're putting your videos online, um, I've been embedding my videos in Moodle and um, you know, everything you do in Moodle has to be copyright compliant. So I have the added time layer then of finding images that are copyright compliant, um, copying the, um, the uh, copyright information for each image um, as well into another file. 
So then you have to take the time to uh, tape yourself delivering the lecture. And then you have to go into the video editing process to input all your images and all your call outs and so on. Um, and uh, I have a really hard time not having a lot of interest um, happening on the screen. So I'm constantly ensuring that something is going on. Um, I have a really hard time, say, leaving up an image for longer than a minute or having sort of dead airspace or nothing going on while I'm just a talking head. So this adds even more time to the video editing. And then you have to upload your video. And then you have to ensure that you post all of your um, uh, image credits uh, on Moodle as well, along with uh, posting the link to your video. Um, so it's really worth it to invest in the right equipment, the fancy microphone, the expensive hard drive, and the high-speed internet. So let's return to the three issues identified at the beginning of the screencast. So the first one was the issue of the architectural foundation of lectures, audio or visual. So for me, um, the um, architectural foundation of all my lectures really has been audio. But I wonder if the longer that I do uh, screencasting, the more my method is going to become more hybridized. And I'm going to start integrating um, images as well into the architectural foundation. So it's going to be an interesting process to keep my eye on. Uh, the second level, second issue is really the level of detail. So this is a constant struggle for me. And especially since I've discovered my inner scrapbooker, booker, this really drags me down a lot. But it's something that I really would like to resolve over time. The more screencast lectures I produced, I think the more I'll have an issue on what's too much detail and what's not enough detail. Um, and then the third issue is um, my position in the lecture. And this has certainly been the most fruitful concern for me. So I do strongly believe that I need to be in the screenshot. I need to be talking directly to my audience, but I really prefer to be the scribe on the side rather than in the center of the screen. So I also want to point you to a really interesting website that's connected to the uh, software ScreenFlow. And that is um, a website called the Flipped Classroom. And it discusses the pedagogy behind screencasting. So it's essentially an experiment that a group of high school teachers um, conducted, whereby they actually stopped lecturing in uh, classroom during the day in classroom time. They instead used their classroom time to um, have students do homework do group activities, do assignments, and do workshops. And then they started just recording their lectures. And instead of having students go home and, and do their homework, in the evening, the students would go home and watch the screencast of their lecture. So they found by flipping the classroom, by actually having them give their lectures as a commodity that, that the students watched or a product the students watched at home, and then using the classroom time for more active active learning and active interaction, uh, they found that they've uh, really improved their uh, rates of staying in school. They've really decreased the uh, amount of dropouts. So it's an interesting model to think about for moving forward with teaching. So in sum, space and time are really the big issues to confront in wading into the world of screencasting. So the time it takes to learn and produce the videos and also the amount of space that they require. Um, I don't want to scare people away. I want to say that I, I want to encourage people to just jump right in and start trying it and trying out their own models. I presented you with challenges I found. You may find completely different challenges or ways of doing things. I strongly uh, suggest that people go with method two, which is speaking over your PowerPoint. This is a, a, a much easier way to jump into it and it takes much less time. So and then you can transition to, into method three if you like. Uh, but even if you're not comfortable being on camera, you can still try doing screencasting by simply doing a voiceover of your PowerPoints. But you may turn out to be like me and discover that you secretly love to watch yourself on the big screen.